All right, welcome everyone. Good morning, and thank you so much for starting your day with us to learn more today about identifying children and youth with special health care needs and understanding their health and care coordination needs. Learning some real world strat model methods and strategies. The quick heads up about some of the technology pieces today. Um, everyone is and will remain on a global mute, and so the best way to ask your questions is to submit them in the questions pane, which is depicted here on the screen. Um, it'll be on the right side of your screen. You can chat them in, and then I will um, sort through them and send them to our presenter for the end of the presentation. We also have a few handouts for you, including the PDF of the slides and um, another tool that our presenter will walk through with you. Um, so that handouts, uh, the handouts are right below that questions pane. So, uh, but we'll explain that when we get to it. Um, before we get started, a couple of words about the Patient Center Primary Care Institute. It is a public-private partnership launched in 2012 with the support of the Oregon Health Authority and Northwest Health Foundation. It's managed by Oregon Healthcare Quality Corporation, or QCorp. Together with the experts we partner with, our goal is to get primary care practices connected to a broad array of technical assistance as they work towards the patient-centered primary care home or medical home model of care. We work to serve practices at all stages of transformation and to build capacity and create alignment to support ongoing transformation and quality improvement in Oregon. And I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Rebecca Valley, uh, improvement or facilitation and improvement specialist, and I'll just be helping to moderate the webinar today. We encourage you to visit our website, www.pcpci.org, to access resources, including previous webinars. And you can also sign up for our email list on the website, which is how we will announce additional web-based and other training opportunities or programs in the future. And as I mentioned, the Institute aims to help primary care practices achieve recognition as a primary care home through the State of Oregon's Patient-Centered Primary Care Home, or PCPCH, program. The model is a set of standards organized under six core attributes, which you see here. You can visit the PCPCH program website at primarycarehome.oregon.gov to learn more. And with that, without further ado, I am um, very pleased to present our fantastic speaker today, um, Colleen Ruin. Ms. Ruin has over 19 years working with primary care practices and health systems to improve the quality of care providing, provided to children and adolescents. She also has extensive experience with developing and implementing reliable and valid quality measures based on claims and electronic medical record data. A key component of Ms. Newland's work has been focused on adolescent preventive services and implementation of Bright Futures recommendations. Over the last three years, OPEP has worked with new, the Oregon Pediatric Improvement Partnership has worked with numerous practices to implement depression and substance abuse screening and follow-up. Through this work, OPIP has identified a number of policy barriers and opportunities for improvement. More information about OPIP can be found at www.oregon-pip.org, and I'll put that in the chat. But without further ado, um, I'd like to turn things over to you, Ms. Ruland. Thanks so much, and thanks everybody for joining early on a Tuesday morning. I'm excited to share some of the things we've been learning about a really fun but complicated topic. So in terms of my goal for this webinar, uh, my goal is to really kind of walk through uh, how and why identifying children and youth with special health care needs is different than identifying adults with special health care needs. Um, in looking at the audience for this webinar, I see that there are a lot of uh, practice level folks and a lot of system level folks that lightly think about both populations. And so one of my goals for this webinar is to kind of help illuminate um, why when you're trying to focus on children, there's an intentional different methodology that needs to be used. And then I'm, what, I'm, what I'm going to do is highlight specific methods that can be used to identify children and youth with special health care needs. And again, because of the audience that we have for this webinar, I'm going to um, spotlight strategies that individual primary care practices have used, and then I'm going to try to spotlight strategies that systems have used so that uh, the folks that are sitting from both of those different tables get some applied examples that would be helpful. 
And then within each example, knowing that the purpose of identifying is to, to use the information that, or use that population um, that you're identifying, within each example, I'm going to provide um, tips and strategies for how tools could be used to better inform child and family-centered care coordination processes. So if I haven't already made it clear, obviously pediatric is in our title. We focus on children um, across the state, knowing that children are searched by a variety of providers. But throughout this presentation, when I'm talking about identification and when I'm talking about care coordination, I am specifically talking about children, but I do include adolescents going up to 21. So why are approaches to identifying children and youth with special health care needs different than those for adults? One of the really helpful things that can kind of help set the stage for um, who children and youth with special health care needs are is the Maternal and Child Health Bureau definition. So the Maternal and Child Health Bureau definition says that children and youth with special health care needs are those who have or are at increased risk for a chronic physical, developmental, behavioral, or emotional condition and who also require health and related services of a type or amount beyond that required by children generally. So three key points of this definition. One is that it notes that there must be the presence of a condition, but not necessarily a diagnosis. The second is that they utilize more services than would be expected normally. But one of the things you'll note is it doesn't necessarily say health care services. It says health and related services. And then the third is that it includes the at risk, because again, if you're trying to identify children with special health care needs, we're trying to identify them so that we can serve them better before they create things that may create a diagnosis. So when you're thinking about, for, for those of you that are in health systems that have been identifying adults with chronic, adults with special health care needs, one of the most common strategies that people use to identify adults with chronic conditions is to actually focus on the chronic condition part. Um, and because adults and the comorbidity of chronic conditions, if you pick the top four conditions in adults, you'll most likely identify most of adults with special health care needs. However, children don't have chronic conditions uh, for the most part. Um, and if you pick one diagnosis, for example, if you pick the top four, if you picked asthma, ADHD, you wouldn't actually identify the majority of children in special health care needs because there are a lot of conditions and, and diagnoses that children have, um, but it's a small percentage of children. So it creates this catch-22 that you can't just pick the top four to identify the most. And then lastly, again, because the definition of the Maternal and Child Health Bureau's Children Youth and Special Health Care Needs is that a child experiences a consequence, um, there's a lot of times that a child will have a consequence um, and be experiencing a consequence and be experiencing uh, more healthcare utilization, but don't, they don't have a diagnosis yet. So again, this kind of pitfall of using strategies that are anchored to diagnoses. So using this definition, uh, you know, this broad definition that I just focused on, how many children and youth uh, with special health care needs are there in Oregon? So the estimated number of children and youth with special health care needs in Oregon is 119,187 children. So that's about 13.7% of children in Oregon are children and youth with special health care needs. Um, and if you're in systems or practices trying to kind of advocate for why these kids are important to focus on, um, there's a really helpful tool that Rebecca will put in the, the chat box that's um, childhealthdata.org. And it helps kind of demonstrate in Oregon compared to national What's the impact on children and youth with special health care needs? And I just provided a snapshot on the right, but um, this broad population, not only are they an important population to focus on, but they definitely experiencing, they experience more health burden. So let's talk about that. So you all agree to join a webinar at 8 o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday, um, but why should you identify children with special health care needs, and why is it an important strategy for patient-centered primary care homes and for health systems? So let's start with the practice level, because uh, um, a good chunk of you are from practice. So why patient-centered primary care homes should identify children with special health care needs, partially because the original definition of medical home 
was developed for this specific population. So back in 1967, the American Academy of Pediatrics recognized that if you're really trying to serve uh, children with special health care needs, um, they need a node in their primary care to help coordinate services across all those different um, services that they're receiving in healthcare, within their school, and within the community. The second is that, um, you know, a key component of patient-centered primary care home, and I'm going to highlight some of the standards in just a second, is population management, that you're, you're identifying and tracking a population and making sure that their needs are met. Um, so in order to identify and manage a population of children with special health care needs, you need specific strategies around that. Um, so that's why we wanted to create this webinar, to kind of highlight the different strategies that you could use. Um, a while ago, OPIP and our parent partner, who um, our parent partner has a child with special health care needs, wrote a blog about why in specifically patient-centered medical homes are important specifically for children used with special health care needs. And there's a link to that in the slide here and also in the chat box. So in terms of the 217 standards, which were just, the tech specs were just released, um, you know, this, this idea that you have to identify and manage a population weighs quite heavily in terms of the number of points that are in the standards. So there's a standard around population data management um, and being able to identify uh, children with special health care needs if you serve children in your practice. Um, there's also a standard around complex care management, and that really kind of highlights that you need to be able to describe and demonstrate your process for, again, identifying and coordinating the care of patients with complex needs. So for any of those practices that serve children, there needs to be a distinct strategy around that. And then obviously, uh, in terms of referral and care coordination, this is needed for the population that needs those, those kind of coordinated services. And again, children and youth with special health care needs would be the denominator for these kinds of tracking and specialty care coordination services. So again, we have people assigned that from health systems. So why would it be important for a health system to identify children with special health care needs? And I would say that, you know, one of the benefits of a health system, and in particular coordinated care organizations in Oregon, is that, you know, children with special health care needs have a specific need for comprehensive and coordinated care because, again, they're receiving services across various uh, settings. Um, and so one really fantastic thing that a health system can do is help, um, help develop and support approaches to coordination um, and help develop and support approaches for families to um, help make it navigatable. And again, just like practices are meant to do population management, health systems, uh, and, and again, and coordinated care organizations are meant to do population management. So in order to manage the population of children with special health care needs, you need to be able to identify them. Um, and I would say further that one of the kind of heavy emphasis within coordinated care organizations has been around assessing for quality and assessing for disparities in quality. And it seems that children with special health care needs is a really important population for which you would want to assess quality and assess for whether there's disparities in quality. Another reason, and probably one that kind of bubbles up to the highest uh, priority for some health systems, is that while the numbers of children and youth with special health care needs is relatively small as compared to adults, they represent a significant percentage of health care costs for children. So, for example, children and youth with special health care needs, if you look nationally, represent between 15 to 20 percent of the population, yet they account for 80 percent of health care expenditures for all children. And children with chronic physical, mental, behavioral, or emotional conditions, based on the national literature, make up about 14 to 16 percent of the pediatric population, and they account for 30 percent of the total health care cost. So 5 percent of, of children make up 40 percent of hospital cost. Um, and that's just the health care cost. Again, if we as systems are trying to meet the needs of patients and be really trying to achieve the triple aim, then we also need to take into account the cost to the family. And this is a big issue for children with special health care needs, that um, in the absence of a highly functioning medical home and a highly functioning health system, families are required to become the care coordinators, in addition to their role of caretaking the child. Um, and so families with children with special health care needs really often articulate a frustration of being unable to parent their children due to the overwhelming demands of navigating the complex system. And if you go back to the slide that I had of some of the 
data findings for children with special health care needs, it's quite clear the impact that um, managing and coordinating care for their child is having. So the title of this webinar is How Do You Identify Children with Special Health Care Needs? So I think one of the really important things to point at the very beginning is, is there a gold standard? Is there one way to identify children with special health care needs that I'm going to focus on the rest of the webinar? And my answer is yes and no. Because the best methodology to identify children with youth with special health care needs depends. And it depends on, one, why are you identifying children with special health care needs? Like, what's your goal for that? And then two, what data do you have available? So let me talk through that. So there are various reasons why you might identify children with special health care needs, and those various reasons are going to lead you to different methodologies that will help you operationalize the reason. So one reason is you may be wanting to track and assess a broad population of children with special health care needs, perhaps the one that maps to the maternal and child health care definition, in order to kind of track that population and assess for disparities in quality. Another reason, a different reason, that you might want to identify children with special health care needs is you may want to identify a specific population of children with special health care needs that would benefit from care coordination, broadly. A different reason is you may want to identify a specific population that would identify from, that would benefit from complex care management. So not all children with special health care needs that have care coordination needs need complex care management. So that would be a different type of population, a more narrow type of population of children with special health care needs. You might be wanting to identify a specific population that you might want to allocate care coordination resources, either within your system or as a practice that you might want to say, we need enhanced payment for this population because this population we need to allocate our care coordination resources to. And then again, because we have system level folks on the call, another reason you might be identifying children with special health care needs is to inform payment methodologies. Maybe rate setting, maybe alternative payment methodologies tied to care coordination, maybe an APM tied to reduction in cost. Um, and so all of those would lead you to different methodologies that would be able to operationalize that goal. In terms of data sources available, there's different data sources. And some practices have a lot of these data sources. Some practices have only a few. And in terms of systems, systems have access to different data than practices do. So the most common, and again, I, just, I looked at the webinar participants, but the most common data sources available to practices and systems is claims data or the types of services that someone is receiving, that a child is receiving. So the total, the cost, the type of claim, the type of service. Um, there's diagnosis data, there's chart data or EMR data if the practice is on an EMR. Um, there's provider gestalt, what the provider would report about that child and family needs or what that provider perceived would be the, the child and family needs. And then there's the parent report for the child or as the child gets older, adolescent report. So, the best methodology is going to have to be anchored to a feasible and meaningful methodology that addresses the reason you're identifying children and youth with special health care needs and the data source available. And obviously, within each data source, you're bound to the reliability, validity, and sensitivity of that data source. So the best methodology for one goal may not be aligned with the best methodology for a different goal. So for example, the best methodology to identify children and youth with special health care needs that's aligned with the maternal and ch child health care definition is not going to be the same as the best methodology to identify children who cost the most. And that's not going to be the same methodology as the best, the best way to identify children who may benefit from complex care management if your goal is, for example, to reduce costs. Because there may be, there's a lot of children who are high cost, but you're not going to be able to reduce their costs because they're experiencing a one-time event. Examples are, um, children that experience NICU in the first few months or children that are experiencing cancer. That may not be the best group to identify if you're trying to identify children who you, who you think and who the literature may support you can reduce costs for. So again, the best methodology um, depends on the goal. And then and you have this other tricky situation that you may have your best methodology of what you want to do, but you don't have access to data for that. So for example, if you're trying to identify children with special health care needs, 
aligns with the maternal child health bureau definition, the best way to do that may be using patient report. But at a system level, you may not be able to get that for every single patient that's attributed to you. So given that conundrum, what I'm going to do is give you kind of examples of different reasons that practices and systems would identify children with special health care needs, and then play out some methods and strategies and data sources that people have used in order to meet that goal. So I'm going to go through um, three, different, three different strategies or three different examples and highlight kind of which population were they trying to identify and why, and then what specific tools were used. Again, making sure that I emphasize strategies that those tools um, operationalize that help you understand the care coordination needs of the child and the family and the best team that might meet their needs. So again, in, in, the, in the webinar, what I'll try to do is focus on system level strategies because we have CCO folks on the call, and then I'll focus on primary care practice level strategies. Okay, so on the left, I've highlighted those, those five reasons, various reasons that you might want to identify children with special health care needs. And on the right, I've highlighted the five different data sources that are commonly used. So again, I'm going to spotlight three different strategies. Um, and I, I'm going to always start with this first slide to tell you which reason I'm telling you, wh which reason I'm spotlighting, and then what data sources were used. So if you look on the left, the example I'm going to give you now is strategies that systems and practices use to, they were trying to track and assess a broad population of children in youth with special health care needs and assess for their disparities in quality in order to hone in and do some gap analysis from, from an improvement point of view. And on the right, the data sources that they had claims, diagnosis, and parent reports. Strategy one, identifying children with special health care needs, population obsessed using patient reports. So one of the things OPEP has done is worked with practices and health systems around how they can better use the CAP. I, I should say, time. One is there's the CAP health plan version, um, and that's done annually. And one of the things that's really cool about the health plan version that OH, the Oregon Health Authority supports, is that it includes the um, children with chronic conditions module. And what that means is that, one, there's a sampling strategy done beforehand to identify children who would be more likely to answer in the survey that they have a special health care needs. And the reason that that sampling strategy is done is, um, again, you, you just saw that in Oregon there's about 13.8% of children with special health care needs. So you need to kind of oversample in order to be able to get a robust enough sample to understand their quality of care. And then secondly, in the survey, there, are, there is a set of five, a five screener item set that was developed by the Child and Adolescent Health Measurement Initiative that helps to operationalize children and youth with special health care needs. And those survey items and how parents report to those survey items allows you to be able to, one, understand in your sample how many special health care needs there are, but two, it allows you to be able to stratify the quality of care findings in the survey by children and youth with special health care needs. Those same items are able to be added to the practice level version of the CAP which again has a really heavy emphasis in the 2017 patient-centered primary care home standards. So if practices hadn't been using the CAPS clinician and group or CAPS clinician and group patient-centered medical home version, they're likely going to be trying to use it because there's a lot of points assigned to it in the 2017 standards. One option is that practices can again add this same set of survey questions to the CAPS tool and it would allow them to be able to stratify their CAP survey findings by children and youth special health care needs according to this broad level definition. So in terms of the, the CAMI screener items, the patient reported screener items, it's five questions that have two follow-up questions. And again, they're not anchored to do you have asthma, ADHD, they're anchored to the consequences that map to the maternal and child health care definition. So they ask if the child is limited or prevented in ability to function, prescription med need and use, whether they use specialized therapies, 
whether there's above routine use of medical care, mental health, or other health services, um, and then counseling or treatment for an ongoing emotional, behavioral, or developmental problem. And if the parent says yes to any of those questions, then for each one of them, they're asked a follow-up question, is it due to a medical behavior or other health condition? And secondly, is the condition lasted, has lasted or expected to last for at least 12 months? And so based on those kind of um, five questions, if a child flags on the five questions in terms of the first one and the two follow-ups, then they're identified as a child with special health care needs. And one of the things you can do is you can add up how many kids um, have one, one consequence, how many kids have two consequences, and again, the consequences, those questions, the prescription meds, above routine use, functional limitations, specialized therapies, mental health. So to give you an applied example, OPIP worked with a um, coordinated care organization. Um, we are a transformation center TA bank provider, and they wanted to better use their CAP survey. You know, they get this beautiful set of um, chart books and a pretty robust data set, but felt a bit overwhelmed by how do you use that information. And so we received a contract with them to be able to kind of help articulate and um, basically make cliff notes from the data that we could give to their board, their clinical advisory panel, their community advisory council, and then facilitated meetings. And specific to this webinar, one of the things that we did is we really pulled out the children youth with special health care needs finding, again, using the, um, the screener. So due to time, I'm not going to go through detail on it. I'll give you some examples. But if you want to see a full presentation on it, there's a link here um, in the chat box that you could go to. But to give you an example, one of the really helpful things to them was they had never actually seen how many children with special health care needs are in our system. They, they didn't have any population-based data that mapped to the Maternal and Child Health Bureau. So we showed them that in that, in that system, 20% of children with special health care needs um, was in their sample. And then we showed them how many children have the certain number of consequences, so one, two, three, four, or five, which again may help some of their conversations around resource allocation or what types of system level um, strategies they might be needing to use. We then help them look at like disparities in quality overall uh, for children compared to the CCO mean. And one of the things that we found is some of the places where there was disparity, the drivers of the disparity were specific um, children used with special health care needs. So one of the trends that we saw is where they had, where they looked lower in some areas, when we were able to kind of hone in which populations looked lower, it was very clear that there were children with special health care needs overall, but then also children with special health care needs um, specific to the consequence related to mental health. So the tool was used to not only look at variations by population, but it helped them do gap analysis of which populations is quality worse for in their system. In that same setting, we also helped practices to use the CAPS clinician and group. So again, we've been part of two learning collaboratives um, with the Oregon Health Authority where practices used the CAPS clinician and group patient-centered medical home where they had the, they added the, um, the, the screener like I just talked about. And then OPIP worked with the practices that kind of help share their data, use their data, and share their data with their practices. So to give you an example, at a practice level, I, I know sometimes we hear practices say, but I care for a really complex population, but they don't have data specifically to children around like how do you demonstrate that your children are complex um, and, and potentially need uh, more robust services. So this is actually, um, the we had seven sites in one learning collaborative, and what you'll see is this is the proportion of children youth with special health care needs in each of those practices, and you will see variation. Um, we also then help the practices, again, look at their, their scores, like were there disparities, and were there areas where you would want children with special health care needs to look better. So for example, under self-management, you would actually want that bar to be higher, you'd want it to be higher than it is. If you look in this chart, um, under that self-management domain, while children with special health care needs were scoring significantly higher, it still was less than 40% of children with special health care needs could note um, support around self-management, which again was a very helpful tool from a quality improvement point of view. We also used the tool with um, the CAPS clinician and group and the children with special health care needs screener. We were actually able to demonstrate improvement in care coordination and medical home components. So the tool was actually sensitive to some of the um, care coordination activities that we were doing. Okay, so let's jump to strategy two. Um, so again, on the left, 
the strategies I'm going to be spotlighting are strategies that, that people have used to identify a population that would benefit from care coordination and care coordination resources. And in terms of the data sources available, the data sources available are claims, diagnosis, and chart or EMR data. So one of the projects that we're currently knee deep on um, that's part of a, of a grant uh, a contract that we have from the Oregon Center for Children and Youth with Special Health Care Needs um, that's part of a federal grant that's focused on um, systems and services for children and youth with special health care needs is some work that we're doing right now with Kaiser Permanente. Um, so Kaiser Permanente uh, covers about 115,000 children um, that are cared for by pediatricians and family medicine physicians in their setting. They currently have about 17,000 pediatric Medicaid patients. Um, and Kaiser wanted to participate in a project with us to help improve their systems around uh, team-based care and care coordination for children and youth with special health care needs. So in working with them, they have what is called team-based care. So for this, for this webinar, team-based care would be a step up from care coordination that's happening in their primary care. So it's it's system-level care coordination resources that are being used. Um, and they wanted to kind of figure out how do we operationalize that for children. They've been doing it for adults but had not yet done it for children. And so they wanted to pilot it in one setting, in the Mount Scott setting, um, and create a new pediatric team-based complex care management team. But they wanted to kind of think about, as they were piloting and identifying children with special health needs, how would they then spread it across that entire system. So as Kaiser was trying to think about, like, trying to identify children with special health care needs that at a system level, they're going to invest system level uh, care coordination resources, but it's going to be housed in that kind of primary care setting, but is in addition to the primary care care coordination. They were trying to figure out, well, how do we identify children with special health care needs? What strategy should we use? And so, in a, in a Kaiser system, in a, in a quote unquote closed system, um, they have types of visits, types of services, which in most systems would be claims. Kaiser is operationalized in a little bit different way, but you know they have basically like visit-based information. They have diagnoses that are assigned with those claims, um, and then they have searchable fields in the EMR, which most of health systems don't have access to. Um, it doesn't mean that they have all the EMR data. It has to be data that's searchable and queryable. So kind of knowing that these are their data sources and knowing that their goal was we have limited care coordination resources, who should we assign the care coordination resources to? We first started with, obviously, uh, a visit um, and diagnosis-based strategy. So if you look in the literature around um, children and youth with special health care needs, there's a proprietary version, the 3M clinical risk groups version. And then there's a number of um, strategies that are publicly available. So one is the chronic conditions module that I talked about relative to the CAPS. We immediately bumped that one out because, again, that one's trying to identify the broad population of children with special health care needs. Our goal was the more narrow, more specific population of children with special health care needs that may benefit from complex care management at a system level. So if you look at those kinds of strategies, there's a tool developed by Feudner, um, by uh, Jim Perrin and Karen Coltow. There's the chronic in illness and disability payment system. But the tool that we decided to hone in on was the medical complexity algorithm, because it was the one that tried to differentiate between complex children and children who are using more services. Again, because Kaiser is trying to allocate resources and trying to figure out which kids do you allocate resources to. So the pediatric medical complexity algorithm was developed by a team at Seattle Children's. It was also validated by a center of excellence um, in the last uh, three years. And um, in the materials and the handouts on the right, we provided an Excel spreadsheet of the medical complexity algorithm. And we have also have a link on the bottom of the slide that's also in the chat. And then on the PCPCI website, um, there will also be the fact code for the pediatric medical complexity algorithm. So the reason we kind of encouraged Kaiser to look at the pediatric medical complexity algorithm is that it creates three categories of children. It, it identifies and categorizes children into three categories. Complex chronic disease, non-complex chronic disease, 
con disease, and then children without a chronic con condition, chronic disease. So the way it does this, uh, and I'll give you a highlight of the algorithm, is that it takes into account not just diagnosis, but the number of body uh, systems impacted and the utilization. So it, it takes into account all three of those factors so that you can create a more refined group of children that you may be able to assign complex care management resources to. So that complex chronic, condition, chronic disease group is a group of children that have a significant chronic condition in two or more body systems. It's a progressive condition that's associated with deteriorating health and decreased lifespan. Their technology depends for six months or it's a malignancy in excluding those in remission for more than five years. And the second group is children with special health journeys, but they don't, they're non-complex chronic disease. So they have chronic conditions that are lifelong, but not complex. So it's a chronic condition that's in one body system, or it's a condition that's not likely to be progressive. Um, so it'll capture those kids that have an episodic chronic condition, but those chronic conditions will have variable duration and likely go down in severity. And then again, that third group is the group with no chronic conditions, maybe an occasional self-limited acute use. So for example, ear infection. And again, to just play out, um, kids that may have a ton of ear infections, if you just use a utilization strategy, you, you might inadvertently pick them up as a child who's going to benefit from complex care management. Um, and so this is an example of how a tool, the tool like this helps differentiate between diagnosis utilization and create three categories that are more robust. So as we were working with Kaiser, we were like, this, we think this is the strategy that you should use. But one of the things that was kind of gnawing at us was if you've done any work with practices, which we've done a lot of work with practices, practices will tell you that, yes, there's a group of children with medical complexity that need care coordination. But the, the group that needs the most intensive resources are the group that have social complexity on top of that. So one of the researchers who had been part of the pediatric medical complexity algorithm development um, was Rita Mangione-Smith. And the lead of this, um, this Center for Excellence of Quality of Care Measures for Children with Complex Needs. And what they found is they had done a significant amount of research to show that if you look at social complexity factors, they're just as predictive of cost as medical complexity factors for children. So again, in a system like Kaiser, where we're trying to figure out who needs complex care management, one of the things that we thought about was that if we just narrow it to medical complexity, what we're missing is social complexity. And if we just narrow it to medical complexity, we're not going to be able to identify the best team for that kid because we're not going to understand the kind of the context and the family that that child's living in. So if you look at some of the work that the, the Center for Excellence and Dr. Mangione-Smith has been doing, um, they, they are going to be publishing a study that's showing that there, these nine social risk factors are associated with high cost, and they're cumulative. The more risk factors you have, the more likely that the, that the, the child's going to have a high cost event. And they're just as predictive of high cost as medical complexity. So again, working with Kaiser in this closed system, we thought, what if we created a blended strategy that takes into account both medical complexity and social complexity? And so that's where we are now, is we are um, looking at the medical complexity, so using the pediatric medical complexity algorithm. On the, so on the left is system level information that Kaiser can collect, and on the right is practice, front line of information that can be collected in order to, one, identify children, and two, identify the best care coordination team for them. So we're looking at medical complexity, and then looking at, within Kaiser, what type of system level information could they gather that is predictive of social complexity. And so how this is being used is, we're developing an algorithm that'll assign, one, which children should be assigned to this system-level team-based care assessment. So of those children, based on how they score on the medical complexity algorithm and how they score on the social complexity algorithm, we're, one, identifying who's the best person to do the care needs assessment, the complex care needs assessment. So for example, if it's a kiddo with high medical complexity but very low social complexity, the nurse is doing the complex care 
needs assessment. And why this is important is nurses, social workers, those are all resources that Kaiser is using. So they're having to be very strategic about which resources do we use for whom. But if a kid is identified as a kid with special health care needs, but they have low medical complexity, but they have high social complexity, then the social worker is doing the care needs assessment. Then within that care needs assessment, they're creating a care coordination score that articulates, one, the level of care coordination that's needed, so how much resources do you invest, but then also the team. Because right now, the complex care team involves a nurse, a social worker, and a patient navigator. And one of the things we know is you can't assign all those resources to all these children. So how this information is being blended and used is that the scores that are being calculated, again, from system level data and from the complex care assessment, are being able to be used to, one, identify the level, so how many touches, the level of pre-visit planning, but then, two, Who's the best match team for that child? Is it some, some kiddos may, it may just be the PCP and their MA and the care coordination that they have on their practice. For other kiddos, they may need the full team. They have high medical complexity, high social complexity, so they need that full team of the nurse, the social worker, the navigator. There's other kids identified that they may only need the RN only or the social worker only with support from the navigator. So when I talk about the, the social risk factors, Within Kaiser, these are, of the, of the nine that were in the, the study that the Center for Excellence is doing, there's, um, the, the green are ones that they can do, they can gather from searchable, queryable fields within their system or from claims within their system. And then the orange ones are ones that they're going to be adding to tools that are collected on the front line, at the practice line, in order to develop system level searchable fields. Um, and then when I talked about the Kaiser assessments, Again, um, these are the assessments that are being used for that secondary step. So you identify them, but how do you identify their care coordination needs? And these are examples of questions. And if you're interested in an example of the tool, um, send me an email, and I'd be happy to ask permission to have the Kaiser Care Coordination um, Assessment Tools shared with you. OK, so for our last strategy, we, we have about um, 10 minutes before questions. So the last strategy is, how would you identify a specific population that would benefit from kind of broad care coordination using kind of all of the data sources that we have available? Is there a strategy that you could use that would kind of blur and um, meld these together? So in terms of th this, this spotlight, I'm really going to hone in practice because we have, a, we have a large chunk of people from practices on the webinar. So within practices, we've often found that it's a two-step process. Just like I described in Kaiser, you need to identify, one, which children would benefit from enhanced care coordination. But then secondly, you need to assess the child and family for care coordination. So the strategies that you use to identify kids often need to be different than the strategies you need to use to identify what kind of care coordination is going to be best for that child and for that family. So the data that's most commonly available to practices that helps them with that strategy is claims data, provider gestalt, so what the provider would report, and then parent tools. So tools that you have the parent complete or as the child gets older, the adolescent complete. And what I'm going to be spotlighting is the provider and parent report. We have worked with a number of practices to try to use claims or problem list or diagnosis. and um, it's just too intensive. Again, because for children it requires hundreds of diagnoses, most practices don't have robust enough systems or robust enough staff in their office to be able to search across multiple diagnoses. And again, what they then want to do is, let's just pick our kids that experience asthma or pick our kids that experience ADHD. But again, as I mentioned at the very beginning, if you do that, you're actually not going to get the majority of children with special health care needs. You're just going to get that specific condition. So the strategies I'm going to highlight are how provider gestalt and parent, can, parent report can be used, knowing that neither is perfect, um, in order to kind of get at a more robust population. OK, so in terms of provider gestalt, um, in general, the work we've been doing with practices around that is to help them at least standardize. So, you know, in working with practices, sometimes they say, just tell us which kids need care coordination, which is a really helpful strategy if you're just starting out, you're trying to fill your care coordinator's bucket. 
but it's not intentional to a population in terms of a population you're trying to, to serve and in terms of design parameters around that population. So the two main strategies we've used with practices around kind of provider just adult um, that's, that's just anchored to kind of children and youth with special health journeys that may benefit from care coordination is one, um, to list out the five consequences and the CAMI definition that I spotlighted at the beginning, and then to use a threshold. So um, for most practices that we work with, they can't um, serve or provide the more robust care coordination for all children with special health journeys that would be identified by the CAMI, by the CAMI definitions or the, or the five consequences. So for some practices, what they did is the provider says that they're having at least you know, three or more five, three or more consequences, then um, we're going to pass them to care coordination. Or they could have three or the last one, the mental health one, and we'll make sure that they then are passed on to the care coordinator. Another strategy to kind of operationalize provider yourself that we've worked with practices on is kind of make it more specific to um, criteria that would benefit from care coordination staff resources. So. Um, if the child has one or more specialists, does the child use one, you know, more than one community resource? Do they have an obvious limitation? Is there limited family functioning capacity? So again, you create this like four checkbox that you would have a practice um, or a provider just, you know, click off how many of these criteria does a uh, does a child and family have? The drawback of the provider just told is, is that it, it's based on what the provider knows about the services that that child is receiving. In working with practices who have used the second strategy, the parent report strategy, um, there are a lot of kids that they didn't know were getting some therapies or mental health services because they weren't getting them from the practice and the practice hadn't referred them. So I think one of the kind of key punchlines that I could say now after working with practices on this for about seven years is it's really beneficial to use a blended strategy. So to use provider gestalt and anchor what that primary care provider knows about that, that child and that family. But it's almost always useful to also use a parent report strategy so that you understand the world from the parent perspective um, and, and or the youth perspective. So again, the, the easiest, most feasible way that we've worked with practices to be able to get that second part of well, what, what is, is that a child with special health care needs from the family perspective has been around that, that same tool, the CAMI Children and Youth with Special Health Care Needs. So they have parents fill that out at new patient visits, so when they become a new patient to the practice. And then for those established practices, established children, they have them fill it out annually. Or for those kiddos that come in so much in the first year, they pick a visit at which there's not screen. One of the really important parts about the parent report strategy is that it's not a one-time strategy. That um, whether a child has special health care needs and the degree to which they have special health care needs is organic and it's going to change over time. So one of the really important parts um, that I, we highlight in the tool that was included in the previous slide is to really make sure that, that you are at least collecting this and recollecting this annually and reassessing that child's needs both from the provider perspective and from the parent perspective because they will change. And one of the things you want to make sure you're doing is, is, is you know, making sure that you're using uh, the most accurate and um, timely information for that child and family. So then once the practices have identified children with special health care needs, are they using this provider assault strategy, parent report strategy, or hopefully both? Then what practices have had to do is identify what specific care coordination needs the child and family has. And depending upon how robust the team is in the practice, who's the best team for that, practice, for that child and family? So this is another example where I can't give you, this is the best tool that every single practice should use. Because the tool needs to be anchored to the care coordination resources in the practice the care coordination team that the practices have. Some practices have only an RN. Some practices have only a social worker. Some practices have behavioral health, an RN, and a social worker. So the tools that you would use are going to be different. And then secondly, care coordination needs assessment tools take time. So some of them are meant to be very fast that, some, that a parent could complete on their own. Some of them are meant to be used by care coordination staff as part of their assessment. So my goal was to just give you seven. 
Um, and depending upon your practice and what resources you have, what team you have, and what time you have to do assessment of care coordination needs, to give you seven that you might use. So I'm not going to go through them all, but what you have is these slides, and you have links to the tools, so that depending upon where you are, we've given you, a, hopefully, a helpful strategy to meet your needs. So the seven that we're going to highlight are listed here, and I'll just go through them quickly on the slides. So um, there's a fantastic tool that's called Achieving a Shared Plan of Care with Children and Special Health Care Needs, developed by Jeannie McAllister. Um, she's been working on medical home for 20 years. Um, and there's a fantastic care coordination needs assessment in that tool. Um, another tool is an intake assessment that was developed by uh, Seattle Children's. And what I've done is just listed the, the content that is in that tool. But if you'd like an example of the tool, email me, and I will ask them permission to share it with you. Uh, another tool is a tool that's highlighted in a really robust compendium developed by the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Child Health Quality Coalition of Care Coordination. Um, they have a pre-visit planning tool, care coordination assessment tool. It's a really helpful uh, toolkit for you that would give you a lot of different strategies. Um, within Chapel Hill Pediatrics, this is an example of a pre-visit contact form. So for those practices that have the resources to co contact child, children and families beforehand, um, kind of questions that you can ask to help guide the care coordination that might be helpful to them. This is the Exeter Pediatric Associates Home Scale. So this is, again, something that is kind of provider gestalt, really fast, meant to categorize complexity scores for the care coordination team. I would say for most of our, well, I would say about majority of our practices have used this tool because it's been fast and they can quickly, um, they can quickly use it um, and it can be based on provider gestalt. Um, this is a tool that was developed by um, somebody here at Oregon Center for Children and Special Health Care Needs that kind of goes through dimensions of need and then levels of support. So again, it's something that is done um, as somebody, a care coordinator is working with the family in order to identify and specialize what kind of uh, resources you might provide. And then this is a complexity index developed by Dr. Hirsch in pedi pediatrics, which again is meant to give you kind of a complexity score um, and then kind of highlight um, which strategies might be helpful. And the last tool I'm going to highlight quickly is a tool that's based on provider gestalt, developed by Children's Health Alliance and Children's Health Foundation. And the reason I wanted to highlight is the tools that I just described are all based on medical complexity. And, and again, I think all of us that have been working on uh, uh, complex care management for children have recognized that you need to take into account social complexity. Um, and so a really interesting tool that was developed by Children's Health Alliance is a tool called the Pediatric Needs Assessment. Um, and it takes into account both medical complexity, but also the providers, just adults, of the social family uh, daily functioning and educational complexity. So um, here's an example of the Pediatric Needs Assessment. It's a really interesting tool that they've been doing a lot of great work around um, that's helping them kind of identify how much support do they give to that family. If you have any questions about it, Julie Harris's email is below and her phone number is below, and um, I'm sure they'd be able to send you a lot more information about the tool, but it's a, it's a great one in terms of um, having a, an actionable way that providers can report on medical and social complexity, knowing obviously that we're limited to what the providers would know about. So I know I've gone through a lot of tools and strategies, so I hope that the, don't forget that on the right is a PDF of the handout that will give you links to all the tools. In looking at the pre-webinar survey and what you guys were um, hoping for, there were some people that wanted um, examples of tools that wasn't the focus of the webinar. So I wanted to make sure to highlight for you, there were, there were some folks that wanted to know about shared care plans or some folks that wanted to know specifically around adolescents. Um, so on this slide, there's a bunch of links to resources that OPEP has created around shared care plans, adolescent care, referral and care coordination, so that you knew that there was something out there. It just wasn't the honed in focus of the webinar today. And so after all that information, we now have time for questions. So again, if you have a question, type your question into the question pane, and I'd be ha happy to answer it. And I apologize for the, the background noise. No problem. I don't, we don't hear any background noise on our, our end, but um, thank you so much, Colleen, for that very thorough presentation. Um, and while people are continuing to think through all that information and, and submit their questions, um, I wonder if you could just summarize for us again um, how somebody would 
go about getting started, especially if they have limited resources, they just watched this webinar, what's their, their next three steps? I think the first step is to identify why. Why are you doing it? Um, because if you're doing it to kind of assess for population, assess for quality, um, you're going to want to use a broader strategy. If you're doing it because you have one care coordinator across, you know, 18 providers and you're trying to figure out which kids, then I think you're going to want to use a strategy that hones in to the um, children that would most benefit from those care coordination resources. So I think the, the why needs to be real clear um, because you should use a different strategy. The second thing that you should do is really look at what data can you use because if you are limited to you're only going to be able to look at providers to stop, for example, then that's going to take you in a really different strategy than um, you, can, you can think about how to implement using claims data. If you, if you can't use claims or EMR data, again, I would start with provider gestalt, but then I would quickly think about how you can embed and use parent reported tools because um, provider gestalt is going to be a great way to start to take a baby step, but if you're really going to be a family-centered medical home, you really need to have the context and the perspective of the family first. Awesome. Thank you so much, Colleen. Um, there is another question here about, um, I know you gave a lot of really great examples, but uh, maybe yeah. for our uh, last one or two questions, um, another summary about how systems and practices are working together to identify yeah. children with special health care needs and, and how they're working together to develop um, care coordination teams. Yeah. You know, I think the best example is, is the, the Kaiser work because, um, you know, each individual primary care practice is a patient-centered medical home in Kaiser. So there's, uh, you know, in, in the pilot site that I'm talking about, there's 10 pediatricians. Um, they have established kind of your classic care coordination processes. Um, what happened there, though, so they have a referral coordinator, they have a care coordinator for with, within the PCP kind of context. But what they found is there were kids that needed kind of more robust services than what the team within the primary care site could provide. Um, so the way that they've kind of, I think one of the really great things about the kind of working together strategy is that the system has information about children and the system can kind of proactively identify which kids we know are going to need complex care management. But that data is often not shared at the front line. So the system, if you if you look at you know some of that social complexity, or you look at which kids might be pediatric, like medical complexity, it's based on claims and diagnosis, and that's something that a system can run and give to practices in terms of information. And particularly if that system also cares for the family, they can create kind of a global social complexity score, not a specific one, that may help identify which kids are really that, that are coming. They're going to have a high cost need. The practice has that kind of first-hand practice-level perspective of that family. So what we're, we've been trying, we're kind of knee-deep in right now is how can you take with the practice, that rich information that that practice has about that child and that family, and create searchable fields that the system can use to better identify and serve the family and work together. So the system can invest, for example, in a global team like a navigator, a nurse, a social worker. To have that in every single primary care site is probably not uh, effective or, or useful. But if you had a care coordination hub in the primary care site and you had the option for a very smaller subset of kids that could get this more robust set of services that could support the primary care care coordination, then I think that's the kind of win-win. So I think in terms of kind of the, the end summary, I think one thing systems can do is better share and use the information you have about the, the, base, the medical complexity and, and the needs of the family. And vice versa, I think the practice can do better jobs of um, collecting searchable, meaningful information about that child and family that they, that they have information about that the system doesn't. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Those are both um, really great. Uh, overviews. And again, thank you so much for your very thorough presentation. Um, 
We do have one more question, but for folks who do need to sign off right at 9, I wanted to thank you again so much for joining us this morning. And um, I've, um, Colleen has been um, gracious enough to share her email if people have further questions that we didn't get the chance to um, address today. And um, just a reminder that all of our uh, all of the resources that we mentioned will be um, put up as links on our website in the next day or so, along with the recording and um, the slides from today. So thank you very much. And Colleen, if you have just one or two um, more minutes, there was a question here about um, a specific focus on children in foster care and looking at that uh, population specifically. Have you um, had any experience with that? You know, they're one of the groups when we talk about kind of like an easy, searchable field that you could say these kids should be included. They're one of the groups at that level. But in terms of kind of a learning collaborative practice of approach around that, I have not had a, a hone in focus on that population. I know HealthShare is doing fantastic work around that. Um, and they would be a better group to kind of <laughs> talk about that on that level. But it, it's been one of those kind of general criteria that's used that, that the, um, a population you want to make sure you don't lose. So, for example, in the Kaiser work, when we talk about social complex, like the socially complex, um, there are a group of kids that's automatically included on the social complexity count score. Perfect. Thank you. I hope that answered um, that person's question. And again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, have a great rest of your Tuesday. And thank you so much, Colleen. Thanks much.